Um, thanks for coming, Full House, great. Um, I was going to call my wife, my four ways, to fill up some spaces, so I'll tell them not to bother. Um, so thanks to Street Level, um, thanks to John and Malcolm for sorting us out tonight. Um, it's been a long time coming. Um, I've been best on Malcolm for quite a while. Um, also thanks to John um, for contributing several essays to this project in the book. So we'll hear from John later. Um, and just a quick final thanks to Peace Conflict Research Centre in Sarajevo and also to Creative Scotland for funding this project. So a Balkan journey is an uh, extensive, previously unseen 25-year photo archive from myself um, from a time in post-conflict former Yugoslavia. Um, and I was there just after the war, I wasn't there during, during the war. That's kind of important to, to make that um, point just now. And when I kind of began collating this book and this project back in 2020, um, you know, the Balkan journey was really about the kind of, it was like the, the aftermath of the last war in Europe, you could say, um, you know, the end of the 20th century, because war in Europe and cities under siege were a thing of history, um, which we didn't expect to see again. Um, so in many ways, the Balkan journey in the book was a kind of personal story, because I felt it could be a personal story, because um, these things were in the past. But I guess since the invasion of Ukraine, um, that's changed everything now, and once again we're at war. So the idea is, this revised talk, is to kind of illustrate some of these parallels that kind of happened in former Yugoslavia with what's happening now. Um, and also to kind of delve into some other work in Ukraine and, and Moscow um, at the end. It's kind of, in my world, related to this Balkan journey as well. So I'll start with this photograph here, which was taken in November 2021, um, after the book was, was published. Um, this is a partisan necropolis. Um, it's a memorial for victims of fascism in Mostar, in Bosnia. Um, about the Second World War, and it was built between 1959-1965, and it's the idea that it's a memorial um, cemetery park, and it's dedicated to the memory of those fighting World War II as Yugoslav partisans, and they were fighting against the independent state of Croatia, which at that point was a puppet state of Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. And there's 800 gravestones here, um, there's 201 mass grave, um, but what's important here is you have Serbs, Croats, Bosnians, Jews, all buried together. Um, so in March 1992, the first explosions of the Bosnian war were set off here, deliberately as a kind of warning sign. Um, and this kind of noise travelled across the city as a kind of warning that war and fascism had returned and that the city of Mostar would be destroyed and divided once again. When the guy that designed this, um, and the architect and designer, Bogdan Bogdanovich, he wrote an essay entitled Defending the City, a letter to my Sarajevo friends. And this was during the, the Bosnian War. And he wrote about this hypothesis about conflict between city builders and city destroyers, and what it means and what it takes to murder a city. And he turned his back on all his Serbian colleagues and politicians. Um, he was very critical and openly called about the Serbian aggression and this kind of fascism that was ravaging across Bosnia and condemned them as savage, bestial city destroyers. Now, Yugoslavia, I, I can't go into too, <laughs> too much um, depth because, and again, that, that's the story of Yugoslavia, that it was a very complicated story and very, very difficult to understand. Um, but essentially, Yugoslavia began to disintegrate in the late 80s, and by early 1991, the war had flared up with Croatia and then Bosnia as kind of political leaders and manipulators, you could call them, sought to create their own ethically pure states. It was a greater Croatia, greater Serbia, and you had Bosnia, Sami's in the middle. Now, the way we were taught what this war was and these kind of nightly news reports, that this was a, you know, labelled wrongly as a barbaric civil war. It wasn't a war of aggression either. All sides were to blame, they were told. And it was kind of fueled by this ancient ethnic hatreds that were unique to the Balkans. This couldn't happen anywhere else, we were told. Um, and this level of barbarity was, was part of the Balkan history and its peoples. So therefore it was too complex to kind of intervene um, and to try and stop this war as well. Um, and that seemed to be the message that was 
It was broadcast by our politicians and by the media. So, uh, like most people, you know, before the internet, you had the, the nine o'clock, ten o'clock news, and you would tune in and watch these nightly TV reports. Kind of, I'd watch in horror and then scratch my head, then tune out because it was nothing to do with me. I was living in Airdrie, um, which, um, you know, was like my late teens. And these wars in former Yugoslavia were happening in a distant parallel universe. So I, I didn't take much interest as the war was going on. Um, but just moving on quickly, in 1995 I had to do, a, I, I was doing a, one of these fantastic degrees that Paul and the audience here will, 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 will um, back me up, you know, social sciences, psychology degrees, great degree to do if you don't want to know, you, know, what, you don't want to know what you want to do when you grow up. Um, and as part of that I had to do this dissertation and I wrote about the, the conflicts in former Yugoslavia because at that time it was my chance to kind of turn my ignorance around if you like. Um, but I spent a year researching for this kind of dissertation and this paper I did the psychological political forces behind nationalism. Um, you know, attempted to answer these questions about Yugoslavia, how and why did the conflict start, how did neighbour turn against neighbour um, and why was it so brutal and fundamentally could this happen elsewhere. And this, this kind of 10,000 words that I wrote um, gave me this kind of vague insight to the conflict but more importantly it started this obsession with everything to do with former Yugoslavia. And the worst had just ended, uh, I was desperate to kind of, um, well I had no idea what I wanted to do here, um, but I was desperate to get out to former Yugoslavia um, and some way kind of do some um, voluntary work. And at that time I had to put together a CV, um, which if anybody remembers their first CV is a fairly daunting prospect, especially the skills and interests section, because I had nothing to put in. So I put down photography, because um, I thought that's quite a cool thing to say that you're, you're into. Um, but I'd never owned a camera, I'd never taken a photograph. And I faxed this CV off to this faxed, that's how old it, long ago it was, um, to some volunteer agency that matches your, your skills. And they uh, just wondered if anything would come of it. So, several weeks later I got a letter inviting me to join this small NGO working in this small town called Pakrats in Croatia. And part of that role, it was a social reconstruction project in a divided town. And part of that role would be to help run a project teaching kids black and white photography. And I thought, shit, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> um, so I'd been rumbled, I'd been caught out telling wee white lies. Um, but it was, it was too good an opportunity to refuse, and it was the only opportunity I had. So I kind of immediately began this crash course in photography. Um, I bought the Kodak Pocket Guide to 35mm photography book, joined my local amateur photography group, queued up outside this cupboard waiting to develop pictures where the old men were in developing pictures of swans as photographers were probably in there. It was a really slow process. Um, but kind of to learn and experience the magic that was, that was the darkroom. And uh, that was my kind of introduction to photography and, and introduction to, to the Balkans. So this Balkan journey finally began in Pakrats in um, late 1996, so August 1996, sorry. And Pakrats was, it was far away from this kind of postcard idyllic beaches and countless islands that you think of when you think of Croatia and its coastline. It was like a wee wild west town in, in rural um, uh, Croatia and it was far from anything um, apart from kind of front lines and destructions and um, landmine tape. And um, this town itself was, the, the first shots here were fired in the dissolution of Yugoslavia in, in 1991 as, as rebel police seized the town, trying to claim it's part of their own Serb Republic and what would later become independent Croatia. But anyway, the town changed hands several times throughout the, the, the war in Croatia and it was, the town was left in ruins. It was around 80 to 90 percent destroyed um, during the war. And even after the war, you know, there was still a lot of tensions, there was still division, and, and nothing had been re rebuilt. So, for a kind of wee guy, Fairdry, it was quite daunting um, to, to kind of be there and to think I was going to have to stay there. Um, this kind of former front line, and it was now, um, it was now a dividing line that, that few people crossed. So, you, you had mainly Croats living in the, the town centre itself, but you had a handful of um, Serbian um, old ladies living in the surrounding villages. Um, but there was still this division amongst the town and crossing that dividing line was, was, was a big deal. Um, but as I say, there was no gunfire, there was just a lot of kind of buildings and ruins. Um, but on some nights you could hear kind of explosions 
in the, in the fields of animals setting off landmines. So it kind of kept you on your toes and kept you in the mind and where you were. You obviously watched where you were walking. So it wasn't the kind of gap year experience that I'd kind of envisioned, um, but it would become home for the next four months. Um, and part of this volunteer work involved a lot of community visits across this kind of dividing line in the town. Um, and the first lady they met here was a lady called Luba Selfifer, and she was a 55-year-old Croatian woman. And she had been living alone in her flat um, here, and that was the kind of former front line. So there was no one else living, living there. Everybody else had left. But Luba refused to leave her home during the war. Um, she became known as Crazy Luba by everyone else in the town, because during intense periods of gunfire and shelling, she would yell at the kind of Croatian soldiers at this site um, from her living room window, and then she could run to her bedroom window and shout at the Serb soldiers. And she was just shouting at both sides to end the war, or to shoot her and get it over with. Um, so she had quite a reputation in the town. But peacetime wasn't easy either. Um, there was nothing, you know, besides a, a weekly trip to the newly repaired Catholic church, she had nowhere to go and nowhere to see. Um, the town and her life were very much empty in, in peacetime. Um, she thrived on receiving visitors and would bring out this biscuit tin of old wedding photos to show her guests, lamenting the days of a handsome living husband in, in peacetime Yugoslavia. And she hated the war and she blamed both sides for kind of destroying her home and her neighbourhood. She had a great fondness, she had no great fondness for being part of a new Croatian state and she preferred to live in the past um, with her memories. And that was the case with a lot of old people who, who you met before Yugoslavia. That they were trapped in this kind of limbo world of, of the days of Yugoslavia, where, where, where the, fundamentally there was no war and there was no division. Um, but people lived relatively well off, well off lives, and all of that went um, pretty much overnight. Um, so on the other side of the town, there was an old lady called Luba Gajic, and she was an 80-year-old Serbian lady, um, and she was living, struggling to survive in a tiny partially destroyed house, it was more like a kind of, you know, a, a shed. And like most Serbs who were fearful of living in a newly independent Croatian state, all her friends and family had fled pack ups. no one else wanted to stay. And that's why it was only elderly ladies that were left behind, even all the, the old men left as well. Um, but the finally she stayed behind and kind of struggled to get by on a day-to-day -day basis. And she, she, she was a typical old lady that I'd saw in these nightly TV reports with a headscarf and a kind of worn apron and kind of crying in this foreign language. Um, and all of a sudden it was like she was, she was there in front of me. And it was, it was, it was very kind of, um, at that point things started to tick that this kind of relationship with Luba would become something quite special. Um, so her only company, she had six chickens, three dogs and a cat called Johnny. Um, and she fed her animals from this kind of stockpile of humanitarian tins of corned beef, claiming she would rather die of starvation than eat them herself. So she had that kind of Balkan humour as well, which goes down really well with people from, from west of Scotland. Um, so this project I was working on, it, it, soon there was, there was no money to pay the rent. Uh, we were the last volunteers in this project that ran for three years. Um, and these were to be the last days of this volunteer project. And I spent most of my time hanging out with Luba those remaining few weeks, um, helping her with small home repairs. But basically giving her and me company. Um, I didn't know much Serbo Croat, um, but we kind of managed limited conversations with the help of a wee phrase, phrase book. And there was lots of miming and laughter um, and occasional shots of a homemade plum brandy. Um, but it was just this, you know, simple pleasures in this parallel universe that I was now very much part of. So this kind of good, my last days in Pakrat's in the goodbye to, to, to Luba, you know, was, was very tearful. It was the stuff in Mills and Boone's books, you know. And I just thought this, you know, my days in Pakrat's had come to an end, but I knew I would be back in the region and I knew that this kind of Balkan journey had only just started. So I only have a couple of photographs from my time in Pakrat's. I made for the camera, but I never thought of myself as a photographer. Um, I think I took 15 rolls of film and I think eight of them survived. The rest of them were dumped in a, in a cupboard, deemed as being a bit shit, and uh, forgotten about until researching um, for this kind of project. But what was kind of key about Packrats, it was, it was never about photography. Um, and I think if I was a photographer, it would be a very different experience. 
I think constantly, I just imagine Luger being an Instagram star, you know, um, and that relationship would have been completely ruined. So this is why I think that the start of this journey was, was really kind of pivotal for me because Blackrats wasn't, a, it was a, the only time that I've had that you get that experience and opportunity to really <coughs> kind of absorb and reflect on everything without a camera. Um, <coughs> on everything that surrounded you, and that's almost impossible now, particularly with these bloody things as well, you know, you can't. <coughs> so for me, in, in those early days, th th this pack that's, um experience was, was really key to, to the Balkan journey. So, Sarajevo, um, so from 96 to 99, as I say, I knew I'd be back, and I, I came into Sarajevo in the autumn of 96. So, I'd be, I was used to this kind of war torn and, um, destroyed small town, but the, the kind of nothing could have prepared you for the kind of level of destruction in Sarajevo. Um, I mean, this this was like a late 20th century Dresden or Stalingrad. Um, it was a kind of deliberate killing and destruction of of the city and all it stood for. The, the destruction was was jaw dropping. It was seemingly total. There was rows and rows of porn, bombed out high rise flats. Um, you know, shell craters and explosion dents everywhere. Um, so many buildings. Uh, in ruins, and, and when you see that in a city, particularly a city that sat in, in a valley and surrounded, the level of destruction was was was, um, was quite intense. But it was I think interesting. It's like how do you pick up the pieces? You know, how do Sarajevans pick up the pieces after nearly four years of war and siege? Because um, the war was over. It's supposed to be a happy time. It's supposed to be when you start rebuilding your lives. But it was that question of where do you even begin to start that process? Um, this graphical map here from Suad, uh, artist Suada Kappa in the Fama Collective kind of gives you a good illustration of what that siege from 92 um, to 96 looked like. So the city surrounded by Bosnian Serb forces in the hills. Um, the city was completely cut off. Um, it was riddled with sniper fire, bombarded hundreds of shells daily. Water and electricity were cut and it became impossible to enter or leave the city. Um, and ultimately 11,000 people would be killed in Sarajevo alone. Um, and this siege was the longest siege in modern day history and it lasted 1,425 days. So, come back to this idea of, well, at the start about, about former Yugoslavia and this idea about, you know, there's no aggressor, no sides are equal. What also happened was there was a UN resolution at the start of the war in Bosnia um, across all Yugoslav territories that put a arms embargo in place um, with the idea that it would uh, prevent escalating violence. Um, and when this embargo was imposed, only the Yugoslav National Army, uh, which they believed to be neutral, um, uh, but it, it had significant supplies of heavy weapons and access. This is the fourth largest army in Europe. It was able to surround the city, it was now in Serbian hands, and would definitely cleanse Bosnia within three months. And the Bosnians and, and part of the Croatians as well couldn't take up arms to defend themselves. And I'll kind of touch on that later when we get to Ukraine and the idea of, of arming Ukraine um, and how things are very, very different now. So the idea of, of Sarajevo, the, the fact that Sarajevo never fell either, and it was never taken, um, you know, it was never fully overrun, if you like, it was in part down to the kind of brave resistance of the city defenders who had everything to fight for. Um, but the idea of the kind of Bosnian Serbs surrounding the city, it was, it was to simply hold the city, to, to surround it and, and no need to take it over. Um, there, there was front lines that ran through the city that were, you could say were legitimate kind of fighting zones, I feel like. But this was a city of 500,000 people who were just trying to exist. A lot of it, there was no military significance at all. And there was, there was radio... Inst uh, radio Intercepts from the Bosnian Serb commander, Ratko Mladic, um, that were recorded at the start of the war when they were pounding the city. And this was actually used in evidence in The Hague. And what was recorded was this, he told them to shoot at slow intervals until I order you to stop and shell them till, until they can't sleep. Don't stop until they're on the edge of madness. So it's this kind of modern warfare tactic where you don't actually need to overtake the city. It's the idea of, of, of surrounding it, an idea of putting a population um, at that. And this is what happened in Sarajevo for, for nearly four, four years. Um, so the Bosnian War ended late 95. The siege is lifted properly in February 96 when the, the, the city's declared fully open. And I arrived kind of like <coughs> August 96, October, sorry, 96. 
And life is slowly starting to return to the city. You know, um, and I, I just knew that this would be a great place to try and set something up. So the following year I set up this photography project for children and called it the Sarajevo Camera Kids. And again, I'm still avoiding real life, man, with a social science degree. I'm just like trying to... So there was, there's a bit of escapism as well for myself. Um, but anyway, so we had all this donated equipment from Scotland and I set up this makeshift dark room and organised um, black and white photo classes in the basement of Sarajevo's main orphanage. There's about 140 kids living in this orphanage. And um, during the war, the orphanage had been shelled several times. And some of the children had been maimed in, um, in the playground by, by shelling as well. During the war, there was an attempted evacuation out of the besieged city, Sarajevo. And in that evacuation, two babies were killed by a sniper. And nine children um, were matched off the bus at a Bosnian Serb roadblock. They've never been seen again. The teenagers were kind of left to fend for themselves because their carers either fled or they were on the front line defending the city. So it was a very, very tough time for all the kids in this institution. And I arrived there with second-hand photography equipment thinking, you know, these kids need some kind of intensive psychiatric help. And here's me with some blank white cameras. Um, but the, 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 the kids loved it and everybody wanted to join in because they had very, very little else to, to do. And it was the idea of providing this kind of creative outlet for these kids. You know, they'd lived a, a near lifetime of war and siege. Um, and this project, it had to be kind of simple, it had to be practical. But most important, it had to be fun. It, there, there was no lessons about apertures or shutter speeds or replicas. because I didn't even know that anyway, and I couldn't even speak the language to say it. So, again, it's still bluffing it. But we kind of, you know, the city old kids, they, they ran about their streets and they photographed anything and everything that, that interested them. Um, their backgrounds, their friends, their favourite hangouts. And this was all against the backdrop of a, a kind of ruined city, because this destruction took years to be repaired. So it didn't feel anything special to them. It didn't feel anything special to me. It was just, that was, that was how the city was. And I kind of, can, I kept on this project for three years, um, 97, 98, 99. And then I realised, you know, I was working in Safeway and Airdrie to kind of fund these trips, if anyone's old enough to remember Safeway. Um, but by the end of 1999, I knew I needed to have some sort of career so I made this arrangement to hand over the, the project to one of the older students and I had to start this journey to get a, a proper job, which was really disappointing. Um, but there you go. So I'm into talk to you. I'm now kind of working as a photographer. Um, in 2000, I'm back in Bosnia. I'm working for an NGO um, and a big part of this NGO's work was in Bosnia. And it was there to kind of document the lives of families and communities that were struggling in peacetime. Again, this idea that the war stops and everything's good. All the media goes home and it isn't that great, the war's over. But really, this is the most kind of important part, particularly for intervention and particularly for a lot of people struggling. You know, you've got high unemployment, post-traumatic stress, alcoholism, poverty. Um, and this is at a time when, when nobody really, really cares about Bosnia anymore because it's old news. Because remember, soon after this, you start to get the switch to Afghanistan and Iraq. And, and Bosnia was old news, no one was really interested. Um, and this was, a, a, again, this kind of critical time, um, and a critical time to document, you know, about how people kind of move on and pick up the pieces after um, all this conflict. So this kind of, the US peace deal, without getting into too much detail, had effectively split the country. Um, it, it was, it, it, it's never worked, but it, what was just so important was to stop the war, and people thought they could never stop the war. So the Americans managed to stop the war, this agreement. But this kind of, even in the 19, late 1990s and early 2000s, this, the legacy of the war was still raw, it was still brutal, and the political situation was marked, was very, very fragile, marked with a lot of corruption. Um, you know, Bosnia politically is one of the most complicated countries. Um, you know, it's a country made up of a loose federation and a republic. There's three uh, rotating presidents. Um, and it's mired with, the country mired with economic insecurity and equality. You know, so, so no one thought peace was going to be this difficult. And, and people in, in Sarajevo and in Bosnia, you know, rightly started to get really pissed off at this. Because this wasn't the peace that they had wished for. And it wasn't the kind of peace that they had kind of fought for as well. And um, for the young people and, and as well, you know, it's kind of... This division in the nationalism starts very, very young at school because you have a separate education systems. Um, 
that kind of work to replicate the divisions for young people. Um, each side reinforces its own historical perspective and political ideology. And there's little scope for real integration um, or dialogue or, or any kind of voices of dissent or a means to protest and, and to kind of stand up for, for something different. Um, so th this kind of system, even so many years after the war, um, kind of continued. But there was, there was kind of young people started to kind of make their you know, voices heard. You know, they were tired of the nationalism and this kind of warlike rhetoric. And some people were kind of saying, you know, particularly those young people born after 1985 started protest like this was an air war so we should have to carry the weight around from it and, and something needs to change here we shouldn't have to carry its weight with us um, so in, in 2005 I returned to the Sarajevo um, on a sign for the Guardian and it was to document 20 years since the peace agreement um, was signed the Dayton peace agreement in 1995 that ultimately ended the war and I photographed young people in their late teens and early 20s who would have had no real memories of war, um, but still their lives were you know, shaped by it decades later and, and, and they, they, they were living with this. Um, and Kemier was a guy I met, so he's a, he was a 20-year-old 20, 20 student from Sarajevo, and he placed equal blame on the media and the politicians for, for deliberately keeping the war in the headlines. And he told me, you know, the government through the media makes sure that people are reminded of the war, um, you know, 20 years ago, reminded on a daily basis. And in this way, they kind of achieving to the people that they consider peace as something unusual and really special. You, you know, this is something you'll never get peace because this war is always going to be with us. Um, and I travelled to um, Republika Srpska in Pali, which this is the Bosnian Serb Republic. And I met Dorothea, and, and Republic of Serbska is really, this is the, the, the Bosnian Serb Republic, really, really hard line. Um, and when I spoke to um, Dorothea, you know, you, we, she said, you can feel the flames of the, the war still burning here. It's as if the war never actually left. And she said, and she was with a group of her friends, all students, she said, we don't like this hatred that's spreading around, and we're part of this new generation who don't hate. Um, and, and we're proud of that. And, and we all, she said, we're all one people and we're all from the one country. Um, but that argument didn't go down well with the kind of mainstream media and, and particularly a lot of the elderly population as well, um, who would place her as just being ignorant because she didn't know what the war was because she wasn't born there. But she's living with the consequences of a war that you know, had nothing to do with her. But she also argued you know, that if peace was to work, there has to be reconciliation. Um, and that was meaning an end to kind of blame and generalisation. You know, Serbs are all labelled as terrorists and warriors today, she told me. And she said, of course, there were bad Serbians in the war, but there were bad Muslims and there were bad Croats too. And we can never move forward if we're all still being labelled. And I think as well, when you think about Ukraine as well, and, and how, how Ukraine, Ukrainians and Russians are ever going to move forward from uh, once this conflict stops, uh, stops, sorry, is um, that's pretty fundamental. You know, the, the, the peace and reconciliation is going to be going to be a, a huge, um, a huge thing to work on. Um, so, on this, my, going back to Sarajevo, my first visit in '96, I visited the, this was the burnout shell of, of the National Library, what was left of it. And before the war, the National Library was the most extravagant building constructed in Sarajevo during the Austro-Hungarian occupation, and it served. It was designed and built and served as this kind of symbol of a, of a meeting of kind of world civilizations. And in August 1992, the library was intentionally hit by shell fire for two days by the Bosnian Serb forces in the hills above the city. Despite having no military significance whatsoever, there was no, there was no, no soldiers inside, there was no one shelling from there. And despite the extraordinary efforts of firemen, employees and Sarajevo to, to rescue what they could as the building burned, approximately two million library items and a great part of its special collection were consumed in the flames. Sarajevo spoke of this kind of huge um, cloud of ash that burned for two days, of all the pages from the books that fell across the city like black snow, black snow. and this was in the height of summer during a um, you know, heat wave in August, very, very surreal and sad situation. Um, but the, the destruction of the National Library um, was a symbol for one of the conflict's central objectives. Um, it wasn't about 
pushing a side back or winning a front line on a town. It was about crushing the cultural identity of our entire society. And this new word was created to describe this tra um, tragedy called culture side. And we've seen in the past year the same thing happen in Ukraine last spring particularly. In the early days of the war, um, the, they boarded up and sandbagged museums and cathedrals and archive and works of art were, were removed to basements for, for, for safekeeping. Ukrainians believe the kind of destruction of their cultural assets was, was part of the Kremlin strategy to erase the idea of Ukraine as a sovereign, independent state. Very, very similar to what happened in Bosnia. And there was an essay that um, Putin said last summer when they claimed Ukraine and Russia were actually one people. Um, but, you know, Ukrainians argue that the Kremlin's ultimate goal was the erasure of Ukraine um, as an independent, sovereign state. And culture side is this kind of tried and tested means um, to achieve this as well. So you see lots of kind of similarities with the, with the culture side and this attack on culture and what it means um, f for the people that live there, as opposed to modern traditional warfare. So I, coming back to the National Library, so I visited several times over 20 years to kind of witness its slow rebuild. And in 2014, it was finally opened again, rebuilt, painstakingly rebuilt, um, to its original um, Statue, and it was reopened on May the 9th in 2014. And that's, the, that, coincidentally, that's Europe Day and the day of victory over fascism across Europe. That's May the 9th, a, a big day. And this kind of rebirth in the National Library reflects this long, painstaking and seemingly impossible road to, to reconstruction. But today it stands defiant as a, you know, as a building and as a message to those who, who, who would commit culture side. And, and to those who kind of deliberately burn books during war as well. On the opening night, um, back here, is it Begovich, who was then the Bosnian three man president, he summed up the importance of the library uh, at his speech on opening night. And he said, The reopening of this building <coughs> is a triumph over civilization, over barbarism, of light over darkness, of light over death, and the triumph of the idea of unity and coexistence. So, Moving on quickly, I'm conscious of time. Um, there's a lot here. I'm trying to not give you too much of a, a history lesson. Um, so the Sarajevo Camera Kids, 20 years on, I, I, I wanted to, this idea of revisiting them and see how they're doing 20 years on. Um, I wanted to find out you know, their the, the journey to take it into adulthood and, and, and how their city, Sarajevo, changed um, through their words. And maybe also to ask if photography had any impact on, on their lives as well. Um, so although many of them remained in the city, um, some of them had real mixed views about, about living there. Some wanted to stay on in Bosnia and bring up their own kids, but others were kind of hamstrung with the corruption, the high unemployment, um, and also this idea, particularly kids from the institution, from the orphanage, you know, they had a near lifetime of institutional care and, and they were desperate to escape from. Um, Janita Kakovic, um, 13, this was um, her picture of outside the destroyed parliament building in Sarajevo in 1998. And uh, this is her picture in the same spot 20 years later. Um, when I spoke to Janita, she said, you know, I, I was born here, I survived the war, and it's a very, very hard city to live in today. Um, lots of things are wrong with it, she said, but this is my city and I love it here. And anyone who stayed during the siege um, understands this. And again, it's this idea, going back to the idea of placing a city under siege, and, and it's the idea and the, the constant bombardment is to break the will of its citizens, um, to, to break them, if you like. But in Sarajevo, it had the opposite effect. And Janita was a very young girl during the siege, um, but she's still, in many ways, one of the city defenders. Not only because she survived the war, but because she, she chose to stay there and bring up her own family. And that's really important about any, um, you know, Sarajevo's continued survival depends on people staying in the city and, and bringing life to it and keeping that life going long after the war and the siege ends. And you, we're kind of seeing this similar belonging and, and civic pride, if you like, being played out by Ukrainians today. Um, and, and that's a key issue because once this conflict ends and it comes to an end, you know, to, to retain that adrenaline, and, adrenaline, sorry, love and passion that you have, um, We've seen it in the news reports, we've seen it across the world, and this idea of the, the Canadian clause, everybody's really, really proud and, 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 and part of this and the adrenaline's running. But in peacetime, that's really, really hard, because once you wake up and you find your city completely destroyed, and there's high unemployment, there's PTSD, 
you know, alcoholism and, and even domestic violence are all are all through the roof. That becomes really, really difficult to obtain that kind of connection that you have with your city as well. Um, and this is Augie Tomic. So Augie's kind of one of the first camera kids students from the orphanage, um, and he would become a translator in like my boy's name, wee brother. Um, and this is him in 1997, Sarajevo. And this is Augie pictured in Cambridge, um, kind of age 39. And 20 years on, against all the odds, I feel like, you know, and through the kindness of strangers and, and, and learning photography, he's now living in Cambridge in England. He's happily married with a daughter and he runs his own corporate um, video production company. And um, post-war Sarajevo, and after the war, it was tough on anyone, any young person trying to find a job and a home to live in. But if you were a child for the orphanage, it was even more difficult because everybody knew who you were. All these kids were living like Lord of the Flies during the war. They were stealing, they were robbing, they were up to mischief. And, and everybody knew, you said, you know, put down your address as the orphanage, there was no chance you would get a job. So he had no option but to leave his home city and his country to make a life for himself. I mean, you think that in the past year, Ukraine's lost 20% of its population. You know, there's 8 million refugees dispersed across Europe. Um, there's so many young, talented and skilled people to, will be forced, like Augie, to, to build their careers and their lives elsewhere. And it's important to know that Augie didn't leave during the war. He was forced to leave after the war because this is when things get, can become even tougher for, for young people. And, and again, this is going to be a big challenge for Ukraine about how to retain its youth, its population and its youth long after this war, war ends. Um, but to leave, the sta the, to leave the story of Sarajevo on a more positive note, because it is all kind of doom and gloom, you know, um, but cities have been destroyed, captured, levelled, and placed under siege, you know, can be part of history in many ways. Um, they can still endure, and the cities still come back to life in, in, as years pass. And Sarajevo may be this name that, in Bosnia, they're kind of linked to war and tragedy when you hear the name, you know, but the past 28 years has done so much to kind of heal this kind of remarkable and resilient city. And despite its problems and, and behind the scenes problems that, that tourists perhaps don't ever get to see, it is a beautiful city. Um, it's a city of crossroads of, of religions and beliefs, it always has been. And the city's put on this brave kind of bold face to invite people um, to see it. And tourism's becoming a vital business for Sarians and, and they're very, very open to, for, for people to, to come and visit. Um, so I would encourage everyone and anyone to visit at least once in their lifetime. Um, and just finally on Sarajevo, in, in the book The Impossible Country um, by Brian Hall, he, he laments Sarajevo and this connection that people seem to have with it. And when discussing Yugoslavia and all its various cities, um, there's this quote from him, and it, he said, Zagreb in Croatia was like the brain of Yugoslavia. It was the university's rationality and so on. And Belgrade in Serbia, Belgrade was a heart of Yugoslavia, passion and anger. But Sarajevo in Bosnia, Sarajevo was a soul. So, just to bring in some quick work from Ukraine and Moscow at this point, again, it has parallels to me personally um, with this Balkan journey as well. Um, I've been in Ukraine several times since 2004. Um, this photograph here is the People's Friendship Arch, which was constructed in 1982 to commemorate the 60th anniversary of the Soviet Union and, the, and, and to celebrate the brotherhood ties between Ukraine and Russia. It's a massive big monument. Um, the um, Kiev mayor ordered it to be dismantled last year. Um, there, there have always been debating what they should do with it after 2014, but last year it's, it's kind of gone. And in 2018 was the last time I was there in, in Kiev and, and, um, and walking around Kiev is, is very much like any other Western European city. Um, you know, designer shops and, and nice cafes and stuff. And it was very, very hard to imagine that the country had kind of had been at war since 2014 when, when Russia annexed Crimea and other, other areas. And it was just kind of uneasy, kind of calm in the city. It was almost as if, you know, waiting to see what, what kind of happened, what was going to be next. Um, but my main documentation in Ukraine wasn't in Kiev or the cities, it was, it was in these kind of smaller rural towns of Ukraine. And an ongoing project I've been working on is on the institutionalisation of children across Eastern Europe. And I've been doing this for over like, 23 years now. 
And it's this idea, there's a childcare model from the days of the Soviet Union that encouraged parents to give up their children in the orphanages if they were too poor or their child had a disability. The idea simply was that the state would look after your child if you couldn't. These photographs here were taken in an institution near Odessa. There was 200 kids living in this kind of Dickensian type building. Um, you know, schooled there, lived there, all dressed in the same uniform. Um, no individuality at all. Um, and most of these young kids and teenagers would have been abandoned here as, as babies and, and never left. Um, and there's tens of thousands of orphans. And they're not orphans because they've got family. Living in these institutions. And... Um, it's a kind of indication of the kind of extreme poverty that, that Ukraine has, and this, um, what the EU and the Ukrainian, Ukrainian authorities had already started to address. They were trying to push forward a new childcare policy in terms of you know, new childcare practices, closing down these institutions, but keeping families together, preventing children from going into these kind of states. And it was a long process, it had been on for decades, um, but this invasion stalled all of that progress and setting this program back decades. You know, these institutions are going to fill up with kids um, as, as, as the war goes on. Um, this institution here was 2018 in, in um, Jotimir, and the young girl, Lena, um, in a photograph, spent most of her life in the orphanage. And she was showing me our, our only, the possessions that were hers alone, because you share everything, you share your clothes. And this was her, um, her only um, possessions, you know, toothpaste, drawn pad and soaps that she could call her own. I mean, it's just the level of, of, of poverty was, was incredible. And this was right across Ukraine. And, you know, Jotimir's a, a kind of, it's one of these routes with the, the Russians at the start of the war launched like 40 rocket and air attacks on it right from the beginning. There was direct hits on the orphanage um, causing it to be evacuated. Um, and then across Ukraine, there was these verified um, reports and CCTV footage of Russian paramilitaries taking children from orphanages across the country, never to be seen again. Um, and it was just, you know, reading this and hearing this, it was just, it's the same story that happened in, in, in the Sarajevo orphanage when I ran this project. It just keeps going on and on, um, playing out all over again. And of course, within a few weeks, Ukraine cities and towns are levelled, apartment blocks shelled, burned, civilians forced to leave or were, were killed. And this is Mariupol. Um, and, and, you know, this is, this is a new Sarajevo now. This, this is the, the unfortunate um, accolade that Mari Mariupol has. And again, come back to this idea, the only difference this time around, I guess, with Ukraine, it, it, it was that the, you know, the Western world, who we hear as a term in the world, saw this, saw an aggressor and saw a victim and would eventually back Ukraine with arms and support. But for cities like Mariupol, that support was far too late in the day. And, and just again, you know, going back to Bosnia, there was no such support from the start of the war, and there was no way to defend the, their cities. Um, and how different that siege of Sarajevo might have been, would it have played out as long? Um, would the Bosnian Serbs been able to have taken, you know, um, two thirds of the country within three months? So Bosnians today kind of watched the, the war in Ukraine with, with, with this kind of, you know, um, ultimate sadness because they understood and they understand what's going on, but also kind of this, they can only wonder, you know, what if that aggression was recognised from the outset and they were given the arms to defend themselves um, right back in 1992. Um, very quickly on, on just moving on to, to Moscow, because a big thing about it as well was, was the idea of protest. Where's the protest in, 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 in Moscow? How can people stand for this, this kind of aggression? Um, and I was in Moscow in 2017 on a sign for the Guardian. Um, there was, I was documenting this huge demolition program in Moscow and across Russia, because um, I was so bored with Glasgow and <laughs> demolition at that point. Um, but this is kind of huge. Gen regeneration was, it was deemed as essential regeneration and investment in the city um, by the Moscow Duma Parliament. But most people knew it was nothing more than real estate speculation. Um, there was a lot of money to be, to be made. Um, <clears throat> and it was a mass demolition of these iconic kind of prefabricated Khrushchevka apartments that are all over Eastern Europe uh, and all over Russia as well. Um, they, they came up in the 60s. People have seen they're run down. They need to be the place. They're shabby looking. Um, and you know, bizarrely, you know, Russia was about to welcome the World Cup as well the next year, so there was this effort to kind of clean up the city. Um, but a lot of people didn't want to leave their home um, or community, and they were given 90 days to leave, um, except a new home and a new high-rise apartment on the right here, 
in the outskirts of the city, um, and that's where they would go and live. This modern, big, huge uh, high rise building. So thousands of residents of the city didn't want to move, um, didn't want to be evicted. Um, very, very highly controversial decision, and it brought thousands of um, people in Moscow and across Russia on the streets to protest. And I visited and photographed some of the families were protesting. This is Julie and her son Maxim. Um, Olga and Vasily lived in this beautiful apartment for 50 years. What they did was, it wasn't just the, the small um, prefabricated buildings, they, they just circled full areas, like you know, beautiful like tenement style buildings that were perfect, nothing wrong with them, but they had to go as well because the whole area was gone. So, you know, couples like Olga and Vasily lived there 50 years, didn't want to go. Tatiana worked as an architect for one of the developers in this regeneration project and then she looked down and saw the plans and her home was to be demolished as well. So she joined this protest movement and there was this kind of buzz going on, there was a protest movement, um, there was things going on, people were allowed to protest it seemed and people were, were challenging things and um, this kind of small scale, scale protest was quite um, <coughs> exciting to see because you, you thought well Russia's not the big kind of big bad um, country that it must seem, it must be a democratic country. Um, Artem and Lucia Stice, this is Artem, this is Lucia. Lucia is from the post punk band Pussy Riot. Um, and the two of them worked together, they, they were part of this huge underground protest movement. You know, young people dispossessed with the old guard running the country. Much like Kemir and Dorothea, who I'd photographed and met in Bosnia, they weren't part of this brainwashed, elderly, state TV watching population. And, and they took to the streets using their, their art as protest. Um, so, Lucy and Artem with this um, project were, he made a plaster cast of their breasts and they ran around all the apartment blocks that were scheduled for demolition. Um, and it was accompanied by the slogan, my breasts will protect your home, loosely translated. And it was a nod to the um, famous patent, Liberty Lead the People by Eugene Delacroix. And it was just a, a fun way of kind of using art, but with a kind of political message. And it was allowed, it pissed off a lot of people, a lot of elderly people and the more orthodox residents were, were, were outraged that there was bare breasts on their building. Um, but with the young people, she was a, she was a hit. And she was, became a minor celebrity, to, uh, particularly the Russian youth, um, to the extent where she's, she was elected as an independent deputy in the Moscow municipal government. Um, this was 2017. Um, and this is when you could protest, you know. Um, and the night before the protest, I spoke to Artem um, a few weeks ago, and he was actually in Lithuania, but his mum phoned him and said that the, the police had came to his door and said um, he's going to be arrested if he comes home. Um, he couldn't go home. Uh, he hasn't been able to return to Moscow since. And then the same night, Lucia was placed under home house arrest in Moscow, electronically tagged, um, and three months later she managed to escape house arrest in then Russia by dressing up as a delivery driver and escaping, completely um, crash helmet. And she's now living in, in exile in Latvia. So kind of today, protest in Russia against this invasion has been made all but impossible. But it's important that there's a whole generation of young people and old people who, who are not with this war, but they just don't have the voice to, to kind of say it. Much is the same um, as it in, in Bosnia. Um, so just finally coming back round to my, my kind of last slide is, is coming back to Bosnia today in 2023. So the country's been at peace since 1995. You know, it never went back to war. The, the peace is held. Um, Croatia today is a fully fledged member of the EU. And well, the UK isn't. How weird is that? That's another kind of um, presentation, I feel like. Um, but in Bosnia, you know, that this kind of, these dark forces and nationalism and fascism have never really disappeared. They've always been bubbling away and they've started to come to the surface again. So I'll, I'll end this talk in, where I began, in the Partisan Cemetery in Mostar, where, um, and in June 2022, hundreds, all these gravestones that bore the names of all the anti-fascist fighters that were, were systematically smashed into pieces and swastikas were spray painted on the walls in the entrance to the necropolis. Um, a lot of the local residents and the local politicians want the necropolis to disappear. They claim it is part of this communist relic from the past and not part of their history. <coughs> local police say there was no witnesses so they can't investigate. But it's this idea of police in action is part of the problem and, and evidence of wider political forces at play. 
So Bosnia has found itself once again fighting in another front line. It's these kind of you know, right-wing revisionist politics and fascism are on the rise. But I think what's important is this time round, particularly for me, is that, and for this understanding, it's not specific to one country, what's happening and what can happen. It's not related to a specific time. It's not related to some ancient Balkan hatred um, or feud. This kind of spread of fascism is happening everywhere. And it's really important that these kind of lessons bit from Bosnia are, are, are looked at. Um, so I thank you. Over to John. I'll go and get a beer from my throat. <laughs> <laughs> so I know we're a bit pushed for time, so you'll be glad to hear that this is a lot quicker than what you just spoke about. <laughs> Let's see. Where are we? So when Chris first asked me to get involved, um, much like his early photography days, I felt a little bit like I was bluffing it because I knew very, very little about Yugoslavia and the countries that came to be from that. Um, I grew up in Ireland in the early 90s and we had our own things to deal with at the time, just over the border from where my parents lived. Although I knew things were happening there, my, one of my friend's fathers was stationed in Kosovo as part of the UN forces there and he never spoke to me about it um, and things fell down fell down the wayside when it came to it. But I had visited Dubrovnik in the early 2000s, I think. Um, and these, these little signs are dotted all around the, around the um, which we call it, the old town. And um, Dubrovnik itself was a city under siege for seven months in 91, 92. Um, it was over 100 civilians killed and thousands of refugees came from that. Um, I found these little signs quite useful in a similar way to Chris's photography in that they became something of a portal that I could go and have a look at it, go and find a building and kind of isolate it and get, get to know the kind of human aspect of what was going on away from the statistics and away from the political side of it. So I spent time doing that while I was there. <coughs> and this became a handy little jumping off point into Chris's work. Dubrovnik also left an impression because where I found and it stumbled upon an exhibition by Zia Gafic, who's a Bo Bosnian photographer who, like Chris, sorry, I'm just going to read this bit, um, who, like Chris, was interested in the post-war situation, the re rebuilding and redeveloping of how people get on with their lives after things have happened. There are some tonal differences, obviously, because Gafic was 12 when the war broke out in Bosnia, and like most in that country, suffered tragedy by the time he was a teenager. That pain's etched all over his work, and rightfully so. He's a man who's made it his mission to highlight inequalities and suffering in war zones around the world. And by extent, issues of Islamophobia and other discrimination that arise from aware, away from war zones because of his experiences. Chris, on the other hand, perhaps simply because he was a foreigner, perhaps as a defense mechanism against being consumed by the worst of it all, he seems to find moments where the human spirit comes through, comes through against all the odds. We see this in the early images of Patrick, the two Lubas, one, the younger of the two, making her soup in the kitchen, the kind of banality of everyday life. It's set against her stories of shouting out her window at the soldiers who were shelling in the hometown that Chris told us about earlier. The other Luba, feeding cans of food that came from the UN aid packages to her dog, while she worked, worked her fingers to the bone to draw her own food. When Chris first told me about Working in the orphanages, my mind raced immediately to the footage of Romanian orphanages that filled their screens in the 90s. The sheer levels of poverty and neglect, the constant source of gloom in the evenings. Instead, what he presents is, is with a group of kids that are very much in the moment, reclaiming their environment through the lens of a camera. We see them as they develop childhood bonds and they climb through the rubble. Chris could easily have presented those with bleak. Yeah, Chris could, sorry, I'm really getting lost here. <laughs> Chris could easily have presented us with bleak horror, just as many Western journalists did. Instead, he found moments of hope and chose to represent them. What the images with the Sarajevo camera kids show us is how those children began to reclaim and rebuild their world, despite what the adults had done to it and to them. Of course, that work is not devoid, without, devoid of the understanding that everything was not good. There's a backdrop of absolute destruction in both Pakrats and Sarajevo. We see the overturned bus behind one of the camera kids. We see Davar's outpouring of emotion as he returns to his completely destroyed football pitch. We feel the tension in Kosovo, where the book first introduces colour photography. 
It's also not without the understanding that peace and unity are hard work to upkeep. As revisiting of some of the camera kids brought stories of varying emotions from success and stability to absolute tragedy. And the stories provided by those he speaks to throughout the journey provide insight into how much work is still going on. We hear from Nana, 70 years old, and providing shelter to, to orphan children who are deemed too much for the city's main orphanage. Dorothea, who was just two years old when the war ended, but lives in fear of a sense of growing hatred and division. It's this connection to humanity and all its hopes, hopes and fears, that I believe makes Chris's work important in the wider scheme of things. So I'm just going to finish up by reading this last wee bit. Never again. Two simple words that we hear so often after great tragedy and humanitarian disaster. Two words loaded with such meaning and significance. Yet it does happen again. On the 15th of March 2019, a lone gunman opened fire in two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. He killed 49 people and wounded a further 51. As he live streamed these vicious acts of terrorism to Facebook and internet message boards, including 8chan, he reportedly played songs glorifying the name of Radovan Karadzic, the Serb leader responsible for the genocide in Srebrenica. Prior to killing 77 people in Oslo, Norway, Anders Brevich made clear reference to Bosnia and his support for ideas such as the Great Replacement Theory, in which people of Islamic faith are being deliberately positioned to replace white Christian Europeans, Europe, Europeans in, a white, in a written manifesto. As the far right continue to strengthen around the globe, it appears that post yugoslavian countries and the wars of the 90s are providing a constant source of inspiration. Here in Scotland, a man named Jim Dowson continues to manipulate public through social media. He was a man behind the likes of Britain First and far-right meme culture's ability to leak into the mainstream through the utilisation of social media. Dowson claims, through his promotion of these cultures and his links with Steve Bannon, among other key figures, to have been a component in the election of Donald Trump and the victory for victory for the Brexit campaign here in the UK. Reports have also placed them as having involvement with Serbian national groups, providing training and funding to allow them to create their own campaigns of misinformation and manipulation. Of course, this also links back to the USA and the QAnon conspiracy theories which led to the attempted insurrection of the US Capitol in January a couple of years ago. Dyson's appearance in the far-right radio shows and podcasts in the US are listened to in scarily large numbers. Just last week, we saw another friend of Dowson, Tommy Robinson, walking around Dublin drinking pints of Guinness with anti-immigration campaigners who are, call, who are keen on calling themselves patriots. The language is recognisable because the networks all across Europe and North America are made up of the same names and faces. In December 21, Glenn Roth's man Sam Emery was jailed for seven and a half years for what amounted to a terror campaign against the Fife Islamic Centre. He too had been radicalised by HN and right-wing social media channels such as Telegram. He claimed that Anders Breivik is a hero and quoted his manifesto in various online videos. People like Dyson thrive off chaos and conflict, so it's no surprise that he's interested in these areas, not least he's found a way to profit from hatred through merchandising slogans and constant paid-for platforms such as podcasts and streaming content. Sadly, they don't go away with it by simply ignoring them, which makes documents like a Balkan journey which show the effort and sacrifice people have made to retain peace and stability all the more important. Everything within these tensions comes back to a need to retain some sort of cultural memory. If a genocide denier such as Madame Grudicic can become the mayor of a town of Srebrenica, or a writer such as Peter Hanka can win a Nobel Prize for Literature despite decades of anti-Islamic pro-greater Serbia rhetoric, then we must find ways to amplify voices of truth. Arts and culture play a huge role in ensuring that these stories are told and that healing might continue. During research for this, I watched Jasmila Zbanic's Oscar-nominated movie Quo Vada Idis, or Quo Vada Ida even, recently, and despite having done around a year of reading and watching them learning as part of Balkan journey, it rocked me pretty hard. Zbanic uses, uses narrative license to weave a compelling but heartbreaking tale against the backdrop of, a, of war, genocide, and horrifying political inaction. It's a tough watch, even if, like me, you have no experience of such tragedy but now it exists, and it exists as a way of bringing a story to future generations that when the living memory is gone and can no longer deal with retelling and reliving its own experience. Of course, we already know this goes both ways. I picked up a copy of Sarajevo Blues, a book of poems and short prose written by Semezdin Memedinovic, 
and it was frozen by a paragraph in which he describes, at the beginning of the war, tearing apart a book of children's poems written by Radovan Karadzic, much to the anguish, anguish of his young son, and describing the way in which he realised then that adults were destroying the world for children. The idea that this man, who once wrote poetry designed for reading to children, was also capable of some of the most brutal atrocities of the war, serves as a reminder that none of us can claim to be righteous. But under the correct conditions, we all have brutality within us. Through this time, I've listened to so many people speaking about their experiences, and it's clear to see that the retelling of their own trauma to the world puts stresses and strains upon them. The next logical step is for younger generations to start preser preserving that history and finding their own truths within that. It's hard to stress how important that is when faced with rising nationalism and the current age of misinformation. I think Balkan Journey is a part of that in a similar context by documenting peace away from the usual glare of the media and allowing human stories to be told. I'll pass you back to Chris now. Cheers, John. Three slides, I promise, tonight. <laughs> this is a sales pitch. <laughs> this is when we lighten the mood. Um, so, yeah, all of these, the Balkan Journey, you know, 25 years of photographs, stories, objects, and essays. Um, from myself and from John, they've all been skillfully and lovingly designed into this Balkan Journey book. As you see over here, the real thing. Um, it was designed by Graphical House in, in Glasgow. So it's a limited edition book, um, 200 pages, black and white colour photographs, and it's English with the Bosnian um, translations. It was very important to me that, there's the, that the audience um, was in Bosnia as well, so I had a lodge in Sarajevo last year for the book. Um, so it includes a lot of these early photographs, but which I thought were shit, and they're put in a cupboard. Um, when I was pretending to be a photographer, um, I've just about survived intact, um, and it kind of documents um, work I've done in Kosovo as well, um, and obviously a lot on Sarajevo. So copies are running low. Once they go, they go. These are the last copies. It's self-published. There's no second editions in the self-published world. Um, but anyway. Thank you for coming today, delighted, and thanks to John um, for contributing as well. This has been a whirlwind project, a lot of Zoom kind of presentations <laughs> we've done, so it's lovely to do it in the real world. Um, but thank you again for coming tonight. Cheers. <laughs>